Dennis Wrigley Ministries, a better way. Unity, renewal and healing. It's been my great joy and privilege um, to be involved in the life of the Maranatha community for well over 30 years. And over those years, I've seen God move so mightily. I've seen so many miracles. I've seen so many lives changed. I've seen a transformation in churches, in communities, and in whole societies. What is Maranatha? Very simply, it's people who pray, come Lord Jesus. That's what the word Maranatha means. So we are people who pray that prayer. We claim nothing whatsoever for ourselves. We are simply little brothers and sisters of Jesus. We're certainly not a church. We're not a breakaway. We're a servant ministry to all the churches, and we love them all. That may seem strange to some people who have disagreements on theological grounds and liturgical grounds, but we do not compromise the Christian faith. Our calling is to affirm the central truths of the gospel, the truths which are non-negotiable, the truths upon which we build our faith and our life and our church. The tragedy is that Christians are so often separate from one another. The tragedy is that churches are not often very close to one another in their walk with God. And right from the very beginning, we had this prompting to bring together people of totally dissimilar backgrounds and to discover that they had something to give to each other. Some were accustomed to formal worship. Some were accustomed to informal worship. Some sang songs, some sang hymns, some sang both. All these different traditions came together at the beginning of Maranatha. The Roman Catholics, the Church of England, the Methodist Church, the Baptists, the United Reformed Church, the Salvation Army, the Pentecostalists, the New Churches, the Orthodox, and many more. And as we came together and prayed together, God made us to be one. And the sum was greater than the parts. And as we came together, we saw God working his purposes out. Now, how is this manifest? To start with, at the very first meeting in Manchester, there was healing. Miraculous healing for all to see. Uh, no hands were laid on the man concerned, but he just shouted, I can see. When I spoke to him, it was clear that he'd been born blind. We rejoiced. We praise God. It was a sign for this community that its purpose was to pray and work for unity. Its purpose was to pray and work for healing. And then as we continued to walk together in a very humble way, just a few hundreds of us, we then discovered a, a mighty movement of God's Spirit. Suddenly, people were able to do things which before they found totally impossible. They were given the gifts of the Spirit. And they were given the power and the courage and the strength to go out and do things which before were quite impossible. And therefore, again, God gave us evidence of this. Very soon after the beginning of Maranatha, it was not just a praising, praying community. It began to be involved in all kinds of service in this country and overseas. And as this community grew and went from this city to that city until we had uh, Maranatha groups all over the land, 
we reached the point where we were getting such good news. People would come and pray, and they would go out, and they would serve in the community. Enormous numbers of initiatives started. They would go back to their own church and form a prayer group. They would go back to their own church and join with other churches in caring for the poor, for the drug addicts, for the homeless where they lived. All this happened quite spontaneously. It was like a plant growing. It certainly was not an organisation. It was more like an organism. It was a plant growing and bearing fruit. And God said to us right at the beginning, as we always held hands to declare our oneness, if you are one, these things will happen. If you trust in me, I will show you my mighty power to save. And therefore, the oneness was expressed in bringing together different generations. And so we had young people coming and we had days of dancing. We had different music groups. We had days of praise. And sometimes we had African praise and Asian praise, Chinese praise, South American praise. We had drums. We had flags. We had all kinds of things happening. God just took hold of this community and led it into new pastures. Were we different? No. We were following the traditions of the church. We were, in fact, very orthodox. But the more we walked together, the more we heard God say to us, go. Now, God said, go to the prophet Isaiah. And he went. God said, go to the prophet Jeremiah. And he went. God said, go to so many in the Old Testament. And they went. Jesus himself said, go, make disciples. And therefore, the generating influence of a praying community such as Maranatha was that they were sent out. Some were sent to the uttermost parts of the world to stay there for many years caring for street children in South America, uh, going to Africa among impoverished children. And over and over again, God said, this is what I'm wanting. You must embrace prayer and action. And if you act, your community will be enriched in prayer. And if you pray, your community will be enriched with action. The next stage in the journey of Maranatha, as it grew and grew and grew, was that we were exploring. We took risks. We were sent and invited to places of trouble, such as years ago, right in the epicenter of the miners' dispute with all the hating and violence, and we saw healing. We were invited to go to Northern Ireland, and for many, many years, we, it was our immense privilege to work with hurting, wounded people on both sides of that great divide. We saw God heal, and he gave us this immense privilege of seeing broken hearts mended and hatred changing into love. We saw peace being made on the estates where there was killing and hating. We saw it with our very eyes, but we had first to weep with the victims. We didn't go as intruders. We went in as brothers and sisters. And so we had Catholics and Protestants praying together till the early hours of the morning. We had Catholics and Protestants publicly announcing that they were one in Christ to the amazement of many of the people involved in the armed struggle. More than that, we had many, many people in the paramilitaries finding their faith, forgiving one another, loving one another. We found victims who had been gunned down and lost their loved ones, forgiving those who did it. And so we saw 
with our very own eyes how God could heal. We didn't go there to solve Northern Ireland's problems. We went there simply to walk humbly with Jesus. They blessed us far more, I believe, than we blessed them. But God showed us so much about how he can transform societies. Now, why am I mentioning this? Well, God comes in Christ to totally change people, change their attitude, their way of looking at things, their motivation in life, everything, radically. But he equally comes to change whole cultures and whole societies. And if we concentrate on the one and not the other, we're only getting half the gospel. And I was very, very struck uh, by reading the history of the early Wesleyan preachers in this country who preached on Sunday uh, holiness and on the Monday social righteousness. They would be preaching come to Jesus on the Sunday in the chapel the next day chairing their trade union branch meeting. And the gospel for them was changing men's and women's hearts, but changing society. Social righteousness, personal holiness. And that's exactly, of course, where Mother Teresa stood. Mother Teresa sent me a, a, a letter which I will always cherish, because she said to Maranatha, if you pray without serving your prayers, will be in vain. If you serve without praying, your service will be in vain. Go forth and pray and serve in the power of the Holy Spirit. We accepted Mother Teresa's lead and ever since we've walked with people, whether they've been of this tradition or that tradition, who've enriched our lives. People have felt the call to be priests, pastors, evangelists, ministers. Young people have been sent out to work with the poor in other countries. So over and over again, we have been pilgrim people. We're ever on the move. Maranatha doesn't own anything. Maranatha has no income. <coughs> we are entirely free. We're all volunteers, apart from a hard-working, tiny group in our office. Now, over the years, God has led us into a new situation. God is constantly leading this community into new situations. We've been drawn very deeply into areas of extreme human need to work with drug addicts, um, to help those who have been sexually abused, to help those who are destitute and poor and homeless. But more than that, we've been drawn into consideration of what is really going on in our society. And God has shown us that there is sickness. Years ago, we, we first went to the House of Commons and we made a call to the nation and we said, uh, this nation needs to turn back to God. And we spelt out what uh, Jesus means when he speaks of, of, of new life in him. And it was very well received. Indeed, millions of copies of Maranatha's statement went across the country. We also produced a researched evidence sheet which spelt out precisely the hard truths, the embarrassing truths of what was happening in terms of broken family, crime on the streets, and all kinds of corruption in society. That generated a request from Parliament to us to uh, look at children and their plight. And we produced a, a document which was presented in Parliament and at a major meeting, and it led uh, to a debate in the House of Commons and a full consultation in the House of Lords and then ultimately a national conference in Coventry Cathedral. And the floodgates were opened as we focused upon the needs of children. And we said, look, any nation is judged by history. 
in the way in which it treats its children. And we are today under judgment. Well, uh, we then went on and God drew us into all kinds of areas of witness. And so we began to give evidence to parliamentary committees at their request. We began to make submissions on all kinds of subjects, um, human rights, health, education, family. And as we went forward, we realized that this was central to the gospel. It wasn't an optional extra. So, in all this, the prayers of the community were enriched. We prayed still more, the more we were drawn out into the world. And as we did that, we grew in numbers and in faith. And so Maranatha was led to the situation where it, it, it was called to be uh, a training facility. We were told uh, in prophetic words, you are called to equip the saints. And so we began major training sources on the central truths of the Christian faith all over the land. And then we were called to confront some of the challenges, the challenges of new age, the challenges of, of uh, the occult, the challenges of false religions. And we did just that. We informed uh, Christians, we equipped the saints. And then as we moved forward, we were led to consider the family. And we realized that the marriage-based family is the basic building block of, of a civilized society. And it was under threat, and is under threat in Britain today. And if the marriage-based family is destroyed, the damage done potentially to millions of children is beyond our imagination. It's huge. Already, thousands of children are in care. Already, thousands of children leave home, run away. Already, thousands of children are worried lest their mother or father leave them. Already, we've got a crisis with our children in Britain. In Maranatha, we therefore conclude that there is a great struggle going on at this moment for the soul of our nation. Exactly the same kind of initiatives have been uh, presented to us by Christians in other countries, all continents, who are suffering persecution. We have, over the years, been directly involved with some of the crisis spots, um, whether Indonesia or Arissa or Jos in, in Nigeria or Iran and elsewhere. And each time we have been led uh, to work publicly and we set up something called Trumpet Call, which is a means of getting uh, Christians mobilized to present the facts to those in authority. And we've taken that initiative and taken it to the British Parliament, the European Parliament, the United Nations. Again, the prayer basis of Maranatha has been expanded so that uh, we now have a considerable number of prayer cells all over Britain. And they're growing. And each Monday, a message goes out to every single cell. We encourage them, and we inform them, and we pray for one another. We have a, a folder which goes out internationally as well as nationally, um, regular intervals to enable people to uh, be part of this praying community. Perhaps I should pause to just remind you that right at the very beginning, so many initiatives grew from the community. Uh, we set helped to set up the Barnabas Project, um, which works for people on the streets. A huge outreach. It's now a separate body, praise God. And then Mother's Prayers. Um, that was set up to encourage groups, hundreds and hundreds of groups in each country, to pray for their children. Uh, it's now operating in over a 100 countries worldwide. We were encouraged to set up the Caleb initiative for youngsters in and out of prison and often unemployed. And we were encouraged to set up uh, another project for many years working for children in uh, Kenya and Sudan. 
And I think it's important to recognize that when Christians of all traditions come together and pray, God gives them opportunities. A clinic in Pakistan, a center for disabled children in South Africa, a place for young boys in and out of prison in South America. And this is part and parcel of the prayer life of the community. We have a range of prayer facilities and perhaps uh, it can be summed up best in the Shalom prayer, which is a simple prayer given to my wife and myself on a remote Greek island many years ago. And it has been a wonderful thing. It's gone all over the world. Why? Not because of my skill, but because God wanted to teach people how to pray in words which were meaningful to them. And so, well over 11 million of those are now being used all over the world in many different languages. And we praise God and we're filled with awe. I want to share my concern at this moment. The doors of opportunity opening to this community are greater than they have ever been. In years gone by, we've taken the initiative in bringing Christians together in a, in a Catholic cathedral and then taking them to an Anglican cathedral. And we've done it in various parts of the country. And there's been immense joy and immense fruit. But now, the doors of opportunity facing us are huge. The healing ministry is generating requests which are quite overwhelming. Now, all this is of God. This community doesn't shoot off in all directions. Not only is it a, a, a praying community, it's a listening community. You see, I, I, I think we've got to grasp again. Um, God is, is a listening God. And he wants us also to listen, to listen to him. He will listen to us. But we need to listen to him. And so contemplative prayer is a dynamic central part of the Maranatha community. Interestingly, it's the young people who are grabbing this. There are lots of initiatives underway. Something called CredoNet, which is a device whereby young people using new means of communication can really be in Christian fellowship with one another. I don't want to weary you with all the initiatives. At the moment, we've got vast numbers. We have briefings on many of the major social issues many of the challenges to Christian faith. Uh, and I believe it's vital that we realize that the assault on the Christian faith in this country is monumental. The power of secular humanism is manifest. It is set to, it seeks to destroy the church. It hates and loathes Jesus Christ. And they are beavering away in local communities and nationally all the time and they want to wipe out this. Now, recognize that these islands sent missionaries all over the world. Now, people are coming back to this country from those islands and are saying, what's gone wrong? Through you, God changed the world. And if we're honest, there is a, a feeling of pessimism, of doubt, of confusion. Uh, we believe that God is calling us uh, to take new initiatives, bold initiatives, not just an initiative in this village or that town or this denomination, but across the land. In order to take those initiatives, we've got to have a big vision. And God has given this big vision to Maranatha. And I want to be honest with you, I'm personally overwhelmed with it. I have stood down from the active leadership of the Maranatha community and others have taken over in whom I have the greatest confidence. But I want to say this to you. We've reached a stage where it, we've got to ask ourselves, are we ready to respond to the call of God? God is calling his people to come together in unity. Uh, we've come to the end of the road in terms of disunity. How dare we preach of Christ's reconciliation when we're not united together. We live in a culture of death. 
and we are called to preach life. We live in a culture of unbelief and we are called to give hope to a hopeless generation. And the dynamic of this uh, can only be brought into play when Christians learn from one another. We need the ebullience and the explosion of joy of the Pentecostalists. We need the reverence of the Catholics and the Anglicans. We need the praise of the free churches. We need all these elements. We need the exploring new churches. But we need to come together. Not organically in, a, in the terms of an, or, of, of an organization and in terms of a, a, an institution. We are not in the business of doing anything other than serving churches. We are not a church, but we love the churches and we love the Church of Christ. And if we fail to recognize that we are called to be um, sheep in the one flock and Jesus is the good shepherd, then the world will never understand. If we fail to recognize that when St. Paul says we are called to be the body of Christ, with Christ the head, the body of Christ was used as an instrument of healing. If we fail to be the body of Christ, we'll be a corpse. We'll be dismembered, useless. We're called to be family, truly family. In Maranatha, we've discovered over and over again that we are truly brothers and sisters with the one father who we can address as Abba, Daddy. When the world sees this degree of unity, this degree of love, this degree of manifest truth, the world will believe. Jesus says it. Read John 17. And so the message I have for you, and I do appreciate you hearing this, is uh, will you uh, rise up with many thousands of others right now? Will you come and walk with us? We would be delighted to have you with us. It has been our privilege to have many young people, many people from other lands walking with us, every single denomination, all these people coming together and in a rich fellowship. But we need now to pray for God's guidance for the next stage of our journey together. It's not going to be easy. The battle is going to be fierce. Our resources, humanly, are nil. The resources which God provides to his people are limitless, limitless love, limitless truth, the limitless power of God's Spirit, who is truth and love. And the gospel needs to get through not only to the emotions of broken people, but to the minds of confused people. And I believe that when we recognize that there is a purpose in life, when so many people say life is purposeless, no, purposeless. Uh, when we realize that God is leading us to a certain direction and point, then we will give hope to those who are lost on the way. God has brought us into being to fulfill his will. And I'm convinced that if we place Christ in the very center of our culture, in the very center of our families, in the very center of our homes, we will see a transformation in this land unequaled for centuries. Will you join me in prayer? Lord, we ask that you will use even us. We pray for the rebuilding of your church in this place for the revitalizing of your people, for the energizing of your people. We pray, Lord, for powerful prayer. We pray for a powerful response to prayer. We pray for healings. We pray for manifestations of your glory, for all to see. We thank you for all the past centuries in which your church in spite of all the sin and confusion and division, has been mightily led by your Spirit. And we pray that now your Spirit may descend again on your people. 
and we want to thank you for what you're going to do. And to you we give the honor. To you we give the glory. Amen. God bless you. Dennis Wrigley Ministries, a better way, unity, renewal, and healing. Thank you for watching.